Welcome to the Open Hearted Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Open Hearted Podcast. I'm your host, Will Wheeler, joined with my main man, Photon. John, what's going on, brother? Hey, Red. Oh, you know, just just, just kicking along. You know, that, that music now kind of puts me in a happy place. Puts you in a happy place. That's what it's yeah. all about, mate. That's what it's all mm. about, being in a happy place, right? Hey, you know, while I remember, congr- mm. oh, happy one-year anniversary with the podcast. Yeah, yeah. We have <laughs> forgot, forgotten to speak about that. A year, yeah, man. so that's, everyone that's... who's listening, last episode was actually the, the year that mm. we had it'd been a year. And yeah. I think just with everything going down, what happened last last podcast, we completely forgot about it. So yeah. congratulations, my man. You're doing a great job. You All too, right. my friend. You too. You know, so um, awesome times. But I tell you what, we should get stuck into this. We've got a really awesome guest coming on the show today. Um, I might call her up, Shay Wissell, all the way from Melbourne. Shay, what's going on? Hello, congratulations on your one year celebration. Yeah, it's, um, oh, hang on, I just, there we go, we got you there, we got you there. Um, yeah, no, thank you so much. I said, you know, I think one time flies when you're having fun maybe, but mm. um, it's actually been really cool to see it start, it grow, and um, slowly see a few listeners come on. But I tell you what, Shay, um, as much as I'm excited to talk about that, I'm more excited to really be talking about dyslexia in the workplace and who better to have come on than yourself. Oh, thank you. It's exciting to be here to talk about our favourite topic. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally, totally. And, and, you know, I think the thing is, especially with dyslexia in the workplace, is that... You, you know, we know the numbers. Dyslexia is like the highest in like the neuro, you know, in, in that neuro, yeah, in that neurodiversity umbrella there. And yet, there's really little information, or it's very rarely spoken about within corporate schools, stuff like that. Um, so you know, it'd be really cool to you know talk a little bit about that type of stuff, the work you're doing. Um, you know, with your charity and your organization, Rethink Dyslexia, um, and really just, you know, get stuck into this. But before we do go into it, I might just do a quick shout out for anyone listening. Now, if you're please listening, please subscribe, like, and follow to all of our social media platforms. We're now available on TikTok, Facebook, <laughs> Instagram, Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, LinkedIn, and please go to our website, theopenheartedsociety.com, and please subscribe and check out all of our blogs and other past um, uh, episodes. Photon John, you ready to rock and roll, my man? I am ready, my man. Nice, nice, nice. So before anything, Shay, you know, I think we, you know, I think our listeners really want to hear, you know, all the... Everything about you, you know, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, apart from feeling crooked, I know you keep saying I'm not, so I'm sorry if I keep moving my head in odd ways. It's all good. <laughs> Don't bring attention to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's my crooked dyslexic brain. Well, I think, gosh, well, we've known each other for a number of years now, haven't we? Time flies when you're having fun, right? Yeah. I mean... That's what you want to call it. <laughs> Well, I think it's been a mix of fun and a mix of uh, not so much fun. But, yes, it's fun being here today, so thank you. Um, well, my journey started um, at 27 when I was first diagnosed with dyslexia. Um, well, that's when I say I first became dyslexic, but I was really born this way. So it's um, – but it first came to light when I was 27, even though I'd been through um, my secondary school and uh, undergraduate degree – and had struggled but never really understood what was wrong as such with me or why I couldn't do things like everyone else. And so one night I was having a tutor over and she was helping me with my writing and I was really frustrated and tears were in my eyes because I didn't understand why I couldn't write. Um, 
this sentence for uni and that's when she said to me I think you might be dyslexic and I even as a speech pathologist I didn't understand what that meant and so at uni I was lucky enough to get diagnosed there I had to pay I think it was $600 at the time and I was diagnosed with dyslexia and dysgraphia so two types of learning disabilities or neurodivergences whatever term people like to use and after that I had a significant and hopefully one and only mental health breakdown where I was, um, where I had attempted suicide a couple of times and was in and out of hospital uh, for a couple of years, really. And it was really my mum, who's no longer with us, that and my family that really helped me get through that time. And following that, every time I went into work and I disclosed in a new role that I had dyslexia, no one knew what that meant. And um, I was always faced with a lot of barriers because of my writing and um, bullying and discrimination and questioning around why I couldn't do things like other people, um, accused of cheating in some of my jobs. I wasn't paid the salary offered in one job because I said I needed some support. So a variety of issues that uh, were happening to me and I lost my job in the first six months and I'd moved up to Mildura and um, because of my dyslexia, they terminated me, but, and they could because I was in that six-month probationary period. And I actually went to the CEO and said, this can't happen. I, you know, I have this disability or difficulty and I've moved my whole life up here. And so they put me into a different role. But after that, I rang my mum and said, I just I can't do this anymore. I can't keep um, being treated like this. And so I first set up the foundation, which was through podcasts, and they went live in 2016, I think, and we've got uh, 57 episodes out now. Can and, I ask what, sorry, can I ask what the yeah. name of your podcast is, just so our yes. listeners can hear or go it's, and listen to it maybe? Yeah, sure. It's Dear Dyslexic, um, which is also the name of our charity, and it's listened to globally, and that's really how we started the charity was setting up the podcasts and um we became a national charity and then last year we diversified and we started Rethink Dyslexia, which really focuses on the workplace and adult support based on my research I've done with Latrobe. This week's been a huge week. I just submitted my thesis. So hopefully in the nice. next six months I'll become a doctor. Congratulations. Uh, Congratulations. Thank you. How, how do you feel? Uh, I feel a bit deflated. I need to go and buy myself another bottle of champagne and a bunch of flowers, yeah. I think. <laughs> <laughs> but what what a what a great like what a great you know um experience oh well you know how was the experience actually like did you find that now that you've been doing a lot of work in this area that it did make the experience a little bit better because you had a bit better of an understanding than say when you first went to university yeah, I mean, now because I've done um, all my study actually through La Trobe, so I've been a student with them for, gosh, 20 years probably, yeah. um, it was, I think it was one of the hardest things for me because my writing is significantly impaired. My reading is slow, um, but it's how I articulate myself on paper. And so my mum always edited my work for me and then my auntie. Um, but at a PhD level, you really need external editing support. And so that was really hard for me to get and it took uh, quite a while. And my supervisors really supported me and uh, being able to access that support. Um, but you, you can get it and it is out there, but sometimes, you know, it's quite exhausting. We have to self-advocate so much, whether it's in the workplace or whether it's when we're trying to study or um, in other things that we're doing in life. And I can think I just, can I, oh yeah, you go, Kev. Can I just say it's highly impressive how much um, study you got through prior to diagnosis, considering yeah, it's totally. the classic people um, uh, face. That's that's um, yeah, that blew me away. You know, like and and like, is this a common thing? Like, you know, we often see with especially females that they fly under the radar a lot of the time. Like, I know for me at school, I was very. Um, you know, you could tell very well that I was <laughs> struggling with something because I was loud, I was always getting in fights with a teacher, you know. Um, and we're seeing that, you know, obviously with females that they can fly under the radar. Was I'm assuming that was the problem with yourself as well, Shay? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I was a people pleaser from a very young age 
and uh, I think girls really do internalise and then that can become a lot of uh, depression and anxiety for us where boys seem to externalise where it's kind of like the behaviours you're talking about, mm. Will, and that's what happened for my brother. Like he, you know, left by year nine because he was really, he couldn't cope in the school system and he was diagnosed after me. Um, so it is, and I think, you know, my mum helped me so much without realising and, um, you know, the, when we talk about um, the neurodivergent population, a lot of times we hear masking and how good uh, people with autism are at masking. And I think, you know, that's in the dyslexic, you know, in our group, we don't really talk about it as masking, but we put in a number of coping strategies so people can't see. Mm-hmm. And so different language, but the same thing, you know, we're really good at hiding uh, what we we can't do, particularly in that kind of group environment. And I always talk about how I hung out with the smart kids. So I always made sure I sat next to someone who could help me spell the words or could help me with maths uh, with, unintentionally. And then when I got into the workplace, I always found the people that could help me, like the admin person that was really good at writing or, you know, the IT person that was really was um, going to be really kind and helpful in doing things for me and helping me in the workplace. So I always tended to find an ally or some allies to help me throughout uni as well. I found, uh, I don't think we're the smart group. We were probably the struggles at uni, but we all got together and we helped each other. So I was always really good at networking and building relationships with people so that I could um, leverage my strengths, but also leverage other people's strengths to get by. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. You know, um, you know that's been such an experience for you, and you know you, you you've, you're going on and doing some great things. So, you know, tell us a little bit about your work in the dyslexia field. And I think a big thing is, I have I, you know a lot of people know I'm dyslexic as well. And uh, to tell you the truth, since I've met you, I've actually been diagnosed as ADHD as well. So um, things have changed, you know. Um, but, you know, I think when I think of, you know, especially dyslexia here in Australia, I always think of yourself, you know. I think of, the, you know, because I know a, a bit, but I just feel that you're more sort of the person, the go-to person in this field. So, you know, share with our listeners a little bit of the work you're doing in regards to dyslexia because I think, you know, the hardest thing I sometimes find, and I'm not sure if you're the same, Shay, but especially with social media and a lot of influencers, we see them sharing a lot of information that can be quite helpful, but sometimes I just don't think that information is correct sometimes, you know, where I think with yourself, you are going, you are finding that evidence, you're doing a lot of research, all of that. So please share a a lot of the stuff you're doing. Well, I think... uh Part of it is my lived experience and um, everyone's experience is different. You know, there are some similarities, you know, the mental health challenges, you know, my story is not unique. It's very common to end up uh, with depression and anxiety and we're 46% more likely to attempt suicide. So um, I I think going through university really helped me to, to ground me in having some evidence about what was happening because Uh, when I went to do my doctorate, I just thought I can't be the only one. And, you know, as a speech pathologist, I'd worked with a lot of young men and young boys in secondary school and in the prison system. And I thought, what happens to these young people? How do they get the support? Because I knew it was through my family that I got my support and that I could not just survive, but really thrive in the end. Um, And I think that was some of the driving factors for me doing my research so we could get a better understanding of what was happening to adults with dyslexia because there was nothing out there. There is, you know, a lot of international research but not driven by dyslexics themselves. Um, Some of it is and there's some great international research done by dyslexics and but not a lot in the workspace. And I think, you know, we're one in ten of the population, we're 50% of the neurodivergent population Um, My research shows that we work in every industry at every level from on the ground staff through to CEOs, board directors. So we can't make an assumption that because someone's dyslexic, they haven't um, been able to put those strong strategies in place to get them uh, into those types of roles. Mm -hmm. Or they may not have had those opportunities to be able to progress their career because they've been stuck because they haven't had that support of um, their needed. Can I say that was really what happened to me? You know, I think that finishing school, I failed school, 
you know, you're told that, you know, if you don't do well in school, you're never going to be able to go on and do great things or you're going to have to do a job where, you know, you're not going to get paid much or something like that. And I think for me, I believed that for such a long time, you know, so sometimes we're setting these these young people up for failure and really it's hard to find that support or even that direction to go, hang on, maybe you did fail school, but there are other directions, if that makes sense. When I, when I you know, think back in hindsight to school, mm-hmm. the amount of kids, you know, who I can see now, you know, would have been dyslexic, who were failed out of the system and told that they, they just weren't good enough, Um it's pretty distressing, really, that, that, that culture around that. I mean, it, to be fair, I mean, I think a lot of it is a culture of ignorance. Yeah. Schools and the education department perhaps don't understand what they're dealing with. But, um, yeah, uh, is, is it, do, do you know if there's any much of a sea change in, in that regard, Shay? I think that there, there is a big movement happening in schools, but it's not enough. Yeah. It's really, and I think, you know, if children don't get access to assessments and intervention in primary school, the trajectory is so much harder for them. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of it comes down to cost and significant waiting lists for families. And that's what um, the secondary findings from my research really came down to those family networks and the social inequality that we're facing Um when we don't get access early and consistent access. It's expensive to get intervention for someone that's got a reading difficulty because it's consistent practice that you need to do. And we're never going to be the same as someone who doesn't have dyslexia, but we really need to be able to put those interventions in so you leave school with functional literacy skills that enable you to get a job that you want to do. Mm. And uh, that's the piece that's missing at the moment. And there's a lot of work that's been done and we've come a long way. Um, I don't work in the children's space. I specifically stayed out of that uh, for many reasons. Um, Can I say on that? Can I say on that, right? Like, I think there is already enough people doing work in that space. And, you know, with the adult dyslexia stuff, there really is very little stuff. Even the research is very, because, you know, whenever I've spoken, they're like, oh, what's the research? And it's like, well, they're actually... I don't know where to find this research. It doesn't exist. Um, And then also, too, you know, um, it's like, okay, well, say if someone, I get people reaching out to me all the time saying, hey, where can I get an assessment done? And it's fair, even if you Google like adult dyslexia assessments, it's very difficult to find. And, you know, I think you're heading in the right direction. I think it's, uh, you know, um, not to take away from the dyslexia part of the conversation, but it, it seems that way across the board with neurodivergence, which is like a lot of people saying, oh, you know, every other adult and his dog now is getting diagnosed. Like, well, yes, but that's because the focus, I think, primarily, and it seems to me across most neurodivergences, was on children um, and all the people. So if you didn't get diagnosed, then you kind of missed the boat and just had to struggle through life. So. But- can, you know, it's, I, it's good to see more focus on, on adulthood now. In, in but area. also, too, it sometimes feels that, like, okay, you, you're dyslexic, say, in school, and then it's like, okay, you finished school, yep, you're not dyslexic anymore, see you later. <laughs> That's, yeah. like, honestly, it seems, it feels like that. Do you mm. know what I mean, Shay? Yeah, and, I mean, all the all the evidence and our personal lived experience tells us that. You know, once you, if you've been lucky enough to get that support in school and you go on to TAFE University, then you should, um, by law, still be getting that support. But once we get out into the workplace, it's just, you know, even now, like I, when I go out to talk to companies, um, I'll say, oh, yeah, one intern are dyslexic, and they'll look at me and their mouths will drop open. They're like, what? I'm like, yeah, you know, you have got, unless you've got an organisation of 10 or under, then you're going to have a dyslexic employee. And um, so it's not just we might have. And there are companies that have, you know, been running for years and years and they said, oh, no, we don't have any dyslexics in our organisation. They've got 300 staff. Yeah. No one's ever told us. And it's yeah. like, well, because it's not safe to tell you. Yeah. Do you know what? I reached out to uh, a theatre company because I wonder, I think I was, it was for another podcast I used to have. It was around dyslexia, right? And um, I said, look, do you have any dyslexic you know, people in theatre there, and they're like, look, no, we don't have anyone like that here. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I'm like, you know nothing. You yeah. know, it's just so frustrating. It is, and it's it's so common for organisations to say we don't have that problem. 
Mm. Yeah. So either their staff have got exceptionally good uh, coping strategies to manage in their roles or they get performance managed out. Mm, Yeah, Mm. totally, totally, totally. And that's, that's what I see a lot of. Yeah, crazy, crazy, crazy. So, you know, you know, talking about the workplace, all of that, what do dyslexic people bring to the workplace? You know, what would be some, you know, strengths there and or things to be mindful of as well? Uh, I think, um, you know, at the core, our difficulties are reading, writing and spelling. So uh, if you're a manager or you're overseeing a team, you know, they're they're some of the things you might consistently notice is that poor spelling or sentence structure. Um, Someone might be reluctant to get up and write in front of the team or to take notes with the team because they struggle to remember and then to then be able to write it down and remember how to spell the word. So there's a lot of different uh, tasks involved in writing notes or minutes for a meeting. So there might be some reluctance. You might uh, have the team member working longer hours to keep up with their peers Mm -hmm. as well. So then you might find they come in early or they're working over lunch or staying back late. I mean, one of the biggest risk factors for organisations is uh, dyslexics tend to send work outside of the organisation if they can't get support inside for that Mm -hmm. editing help. And so then you've got your IP going in and out. So from an organisation's perspective, there's a number of risk factors that they should be looking at to see how they could be supporting their dyslexic employees. But like anyone, when I talk, you know, we all come with a set of challenges or areas for development in a role. We're not, um, we don't come as a perfect package. And so everyone needs learning and development support in certain areas in their role, whether it's to help them progress in their career, in that job, or, you know, new techniques that they haven't, come with that skill set and I think for dyslexics what we seem to find is that they are generally resilient and persistent Mm. but more importantly you know we look at AI coming in and that that's where a lot of processes can be taken over in jobs where dyslexics seem to have those really strong soft skills so empathetic uh, high emotional intelligence and look my husband says that you know there's a lot of dyslexics in our family we don't demonstrate those two skills but I don't believe that's true. I assure I'm highly emotionally intelligent, but, you know, we're really good problem solvers. Um, we, because we have to do a lot of workarounds, I think, on the, without that support, we're able to problem solve really quickly. It just comes and, naturally, wouldn't you say? Yeah, well, you just go, I, I think because we've been in environments where we've had to be able to manage without the support, so we're really good at those problem solving mm. and looking more strategically and, um, like, long-term visionary um thinking for some people they can see in 3d i don't know if i can or not (laughs) can i say right can i say right sometimes because i am such a visionary type of thing with my thinking and and probably my 3d thinking or whatever you call it sometimes i find that may play with my depression because i can visually see what it needs to be and what it looks like right but then I'm not quite there yet. Do you know what I mean? And it's sort of mm. like, oh, you know, or I'm getting depressed because others can't see what I can see type of thing. Or they're going, no, that can't be done. And it's like, yeah, but you haven't even tried. Do you know what I mean? Little things like that. Yeah, and I think because sometimes we're so big pictured, it's, it's hard for us to articulate the detail of how to get there. And I find that when I work with my team, uh, because I work at Murdoch Children's Research Institute as well, and I can see that big end end goal. And sometimes I can't explain, like, how we're going to get there. Mm. And so that can be frustrating for other team members who are really processed or really detailed. And so then you can find sometimes that you might be at loggerheads because you're like, well, I don't think that way. And you're so detailed, I can't actually absorb the information because it's just going over my head because that's not, my brain can't process so much information. So it can be hard because, you know, we've got, we can see the end point so clearly. It's like with my business, you know, I can see it in this global context. And But there are days like today where my clients didn't attend where I'm like, well, actually, what is my process to get there? So I can see, like with my when I first started podcasts, I've listened to three. I'd never done a podcast before. And I just said to my mum, I'm going to start podcasts. She said, okay. So what we're really good at is researching and finding the information about how we can do things. But, you know, 
I've had to sit down and tell you the process of how to produce a podcast, I'd really struggle because it's just in my head and I just know how to do it. Mm-hmm. And so that can be challenging. And so can I also say it's probably done in a way, you probably produce your podcast in a way that is completely different to how it's normally like done, but it works. Do you know what I mean? And I think that's sometimes how people are like, what? What you do, do it that way? And it's like, yeah, but it works, you know, and I think that's the main point. And I think that's how dyslexic brains are. Like they say, if you think of a train line going straight, that's not our brain. Our train would go, it would deviate in multiple ways. It couldn't go straight. And that, yeah. we all get to the end point. But it just takes us a different way and sometimes it can take us longer. And speaking, can- speaking, from, mm. speaking from an autism point of view, that's similar. Um, I think a lot of employers that I've had in the past haven't understood that, you know, I'm getting to the same point but they're upset that I'm not getting there the same way through processes or however it is they prefer to get there. Um, and they don't understand that doing it the way that they're asking me to do it creates a challenge where I might not reach that end point. Um, so it, it needs to be more results-based rather than uh, pros- following but processes and stuff. Do you know, do you know what, right, in, in regards to reaching that end point, for example, right, I find that, like, um, yeah, it might be a bit of a, you know, off everywhere to get to that end point but because of my problem solving skills the more i do that i I then refine it i refine it i refine it just keep on refining it that it becomes so easy and simple than what anyone else can do and i think that's the innovation side of things really kicking in if that makes sense Mm -hmm. um yeah sorry you go shay i was just thinking from your comment around when when um will and i last saw each other up in queensland for the neurodiversity conference we were at or summit symposium and, symposium yeah, it's <laughs> <now>. <laughs> and I, I was there i can't remember which one it was there's a lot of people there though but at the start i was thinking you know why am i here with adhders and autistics and you know when none of us are the same when you know we're so different and that was a real eye-opener for me and a real starting point for understanding neurodivergence I think because in a lot of ways if we're looking in the workplace there are a lot of things that we can implement that support our neurodivergent community in general Mm -hmm. and um and then we need to uh go down become granular and then what actual specific support someone might need and for dyslexics you know it's our literacy support where someone that's autistic might need you know some sensory support or something like that but there are some general things that uh, organisations can put in place that actually support us as a as a group um, yeah. before they need to then go down granular into the individual support. Yeah, Me, so- my, my, myself being a big nerd, um, I was very into the X Men when I was a kid, and I didn't quite understand why. But I was actually watching a 60 year anniversary thing yesterday, and they were talking to some of the writers from the 80s, 90s stuff, and they were saying it, it was the family element. It was they were all different which was what made them the same, but they were different from each other, if you know what I mean. So they were still sort of, they were they were in a world that wasn't built for them, even though they were quite different from each other. And that's, but, that's, that family, but, sense of family and community is what made them effective. So I think that's how, uh, you know, a do, good way for us to approach it. But do you know what, right? Ooh. Like I do sort of find that, yeah, we sort of are, what, you know, neurodiversity, we're all different in a way because like, you know, I've met, you never meet two autistic people who are exactly the same or two dyslexic people, but I sometimes feel we have had similar journeys. Do you know mm. what I mean? Where we can relate. So a lot of the time when I may meet someone who's autistic and ADHD or whatever, um, I sort of have a similar story and can relate type of thing. That's where mm. I sort of connect the dots type of thing together, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think, you know, it, it's very rare to meet someone who's neurodiverse that only has one one condition or difficulty or, mm. you know, um, it's the research tells us that we have more than one. Mm. Well, and it wasn't so, until I got into the community and learned that I'm like, well, what else am I? Do you know <laughs> what I mean? And then found out I was ADHD. And well, I'm, currently, I'm currently on the verge of an ADHD diagnosis as well, so on top of the autism. 
And it's funny if I say that because I'm very tempted to go and get an ADHD yeah. assessment oh, this really? year. Really? Really? <laughs> I, and only because I, because I can do multiple things, um, it's people keep telling me how strange that is. Like for me, it's always been normal. And I don't think it's, I don't know if it's a dyslexic thing or whether it is an ADH thing, that multiple tasking and, you know, just your brain not shutting down at the end of the day where you're constantly, your brain is still rushing and, you know, I'll start an email and I'll do three sentences and then I'll go off and do something else. Mm. It's very, and I still get all my work done, but I just, mm. my brain can't function on just one task at a time. I have to be doing multiple tasks at a time. Mm. And that's the only reason. I mean, it's not, I don't want to then become an ADHD advocate. You know, my area of expertise is dyslexia and, um, and that's where I'd stay. But it was just a personal, is that how my brain works? And so many mm. adults say that medication actually really helps them. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I haven't actually, when I got diagnosed, I was told I didn't. So because I was diagnosed so late, Apparently, because because I've got like so I'm what they class as like twice exceptional, and what apparently has happened is my brain has apparently re- sort of rewired itself to be able to handle and cope with um, whatever I need to do in regards to my ADHD. But now now I know I have ADHD. It's more I'm mindful of it, but I don't really need medication where other people. Yeah, they definitely need that. So sometimes I think it really does come down to the individual as well. Mm. Yeah, I, uh, there's a really good, um, I, I know, TED Talk, but there's a good TED Talk by a guy called Tim Urban, uh, Inside the Mind of a Master Procrastinator, and he talks a lot about what you were just saying, Shay, how he'll do one thing for a little bit and then he'll go and pre- be productive at another thing for a little bit and then he'll come back to that. Um, and that's how he had to teach himself to get things done because when he just sat down and tried to do the one thing for hours at a time, it just... It, mm. nothing nothing would happen nothing would happen. i actually do that because i feel like my brain's sort of like burnt out from that one task and i need something new and fresh i mm-hmm. even need to like i can't sit there and watch like a sports game i need to have the sports game there playing like i don't know the basketball for example and yeah. i need to be working on something at the same time do you know what i mean yeah I'm exactly yeah. like that exactly like that yeah. yeah and i love it like that if i if i try and sit there and work on something without the basketball or sports in the background mm. i'll go insane i'll be like man depression blah, you know what <laughs> i mean i just can't do it and i can't complete the task i feel like i can complete the task mm. when i've got something else happening there which probably sounds really strange no i've had employers come to me and be like you know you're watching a lot of YouTube. I'm like, yeah, but I'm working for 10 minutes, watching YouTube for a couple of minutes, then going back to the work and it's keeping me on task. Simulated type of thing. Yeah, yeah. But you know what, Shay? Like I think the thing is like how can we make it easier for employers to better understand dyslexia? I think, you know, we said before like and, you know, you said something before and I thought, I remember when I was younger, I was open about being dyslexic to an employer and they just had no idea. And I said, look, I want to, um, am I able to try and do something so I'm able to move up the ladder type of thing? And they give me tasks like doing the meetings minutes at like meetings and all that. So that was setting me up for failure without probably even realizing it. So how can we make it easier for employers to better understand dyslexia? They need training. <laughs> and <laughs> lots yeah, of easy terms. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> That's the easiest answer. Uh, and look, it's it's not easy. Um, I think it's a two-pronged approach where the more um, dyslexics feel empowered to disclose their dyslexia really helps because if an employer doesn't think they have dyslexic people, then they're not going to get trained. You know, they don't think there's any challenges or issues or uh, concerns in their organisation. So, um, and that's really scary and that's really hard. And if your workplace isn't inclusive and um, supportive and encouraging of people to come out and talk about these difficulties, then we're less likely to see that happen. Um, but from an employer's perspective, they really need to be looking at whole of organisational training so that everyone understands neurodiverse and neurodivergence because, you know, we make up 20% of the workforce. It's not small. 
you know, that's um, nearly a quarter of our workforce are neurodivergent. And we're really well versed in mental health now, as we should be, but that's taken a long time. But we need to look at the complexities of it, the neurodiverse employees and those mental health uh, risk factors that we're already facing and um, making it safe for them to be able to come out and to talk about it. And then having that training for uh, managers and HR is really important because what we can see is across the employment life cycle from recruitment through to career progression, uh, there's a number of barriers that dyslexics are facing. And so what we're trying to do is raise that awareness and have offer that training so that they can reduce the barriers and ensure that either they're recruiting the right talent because they miss, might be missing out on a whole talent pool, not might be, they are missing out on a whole talent pool based on some of the pre-assessments and interview criteria that need to be uh, undertaken at the moment. And they're really archaic ways of assessing someone's skills for the job, I think. Um, and then that retention support where you're able to ask for workplace adjustments and not feel ashamed and it, that it's not, oh, we don't know if we have the money because the money's there. We can, we've can we just uh, piloted a job access funding project with Hampton Park that we're about to start promoting. And so dyslexics can get $1,500 worth of learning support with me and then we can have $1,500 to run training in an organisation. Is that and just in Australia? Yeah, I'm this sorry, is just, just a in Victoria. No, so this is federally. We're about oh, wow. to start promoting it, yeah. And so what we're doing is we're able to pull. So if you've got more than one dyslexic employee, we can pull that funding to roll out more tailored specific training for that organisation. So we're offering a wraparound service where they have sessions with me and we look at what they need and then we're able to build out the organisation's capacity for that inclusion and support for their dyslexic employees. And if um, someone thinks they're dyslexic, they can come to us and we're doing like a dyslexic screener that's been, uh, that we're able to use to help apply for that funding as well. Um, so they don't have to necessarily be diagnosed with dyslexia. They could just so, show signs of it to be so eligible if, for this. Well, if they, sh if someone self identifies then they can come to us and we can do a dyslexic screen mm. and, um, and that's a separate cost but it's not the same cost of going and getting a full assessment. Mm. And that dyslexic screening paperwork uh, at the moment is, is what job access needs to say, yes, this person is having difficulties. Mm. They are, um, and some of the testing, it, you know, it's an AI screening tool that looks at your reading and so it says what reading level you're at. So there's a couple of different bits of documentation we put together and uh, we submit that as part of the process and people are able to get that funding support. And then the organisation can get that training support. And so really that's the main main bit of work that I'm focusing at the moment is trying to get all of that ready so when we go live we can be offering this around the country. Um, and it's open to all neurodivergence, so it's not just dyslexics that can access this funding, ADHD, autistic. So I'm working with someone with ADHD at the moment um, because their challenges are similar to what we face as dyslexics as well. So... It's a federal funded program. It's the first time we've ever found funding that can support adults in the neurodivergent oh, space. Hey, good on you. Awesome stuff. So, yeah, it's taken a lot of research and it's um, spent the last six months piloting it and getting it ready to go live. And, um, yeah, it's really exciting that we can do this. And um, Yeah, totally. Can... That's Honestly, that's the first I've ever heard of that and I'm interested to see how it all goes. And please let us know if we can help... Um, share it and get people on board i think that will because mm. i think this is the thing people wouldn't know no you know people wouldn't know that that's available do you know what i mean and that's the hard part yeah and then you've got to be able to have it and this is the you know there's so many barriers because we've been piloting this and testing the formula and um you know you have to i applied for it for myself through the business but i wanted some math support i don't have dyscalculia but my i'm my maths is quite poor mm. but because it was an accountant who was going to do some finance coaching with me we couldn't get it across the line because they weren't allied health mm. so there's all these different barriers but we've been able to address those but partly because I'm a speech pathologist and I've got a psych working with me uh Dr Judith Hudson as well um so it, it's taken us some time to nut out all these barriers and to be able to address them and there's been quite a lot of tears and <laughs> frustrations mm. at, at the stuff we have to go through you know because you can see why someone doesn't apply for it because there are so many 
there's paperwork and there's so many requirements and I'm just excited we've been able to to get through through all of that and um, be able to really provide some tailored support not just for the dyslexic person but for the workplace as well. That is really awesome. But, you know, in saying that, you know, what are some of the best accommodations that a workplace could make to help dyslexic so they could go do this course one, you know what I mean? But but this is the thing, you know, um, I'm sure that a lot of workplaces don't understand what accommodations they might need. One of the things I find is that some workplaces probably already have a lot of accommodations in place without even realising it. What, what's your experience been like, Shay? Yeah, and I think they think it's really expensive and hard. And it's it's so not. If you, you know, like Microsoft has improved its dictation and text-to-speech so much that if you're dyslexic and you want to uh, not disclose, that's the first, easiest, cheapest, uh, hidden tool we can use. Mm. You know, a lot of dyslexics can, uh, we can hear the mistakes, but we can't see them if we're editing our work. So if we're listening and watching at the same time, it's easier for us to edit. Um, you know, Siri is another thing. Siri is my best friend, especially since working from home. Oh, there's my little daughter. Oh, you can't see it. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, yes, yeah. <laughs> wouldn't surprise me. You know, I don't want to pigeonhole her into being neurodivergent, but it's very likely. It's a high possibility. <laughs> All good, all good. She is uh, gorgeous. But, you know, Siri, especially now because my husband, we don't work in the same rooms, thank goodness, we kill each other, but we're not in the office a lot. So I talk to Siri all the time to help me with my spelling now if I can't find a word. And if you're in the workplace, again, that's such a simple tool. Everyone has their phone at work. Um, Grammarly is another one that's really easy. I use ChatGTP a lot now to help me restructure my writing as well. That's, I was um, about to ask, yeah. Yeah. I think AI is going to help a lot more in this sense in the future. Oh, I think it's game changing for us. I mean, I used to use something called WordTune. So if I couldn't get my sentence right, I would put it in it and it would rewrite it for me in about seven different ways. And mm. so I'll still use that now. Um, if I can't get it, I know it can sound better and I'm stuck with how to mm. reword it. So there's tools like that and through the job access program, the government will fund that. Um, but it's not just uh, technology that helps us. I really think that one-on-one coaching is really important to be able to talk to someone about the challenges you're facing in the workplace and to be able to build up your um, your skills around self-advocacy and just having a peer to talk to. I think it's really I, important. Oh, no, you're dead right because I think the thing is, especially with the rise of technology, you know, I'm seeing so many like, hey, this is for ADHD or this is for dyslexia or this is for autism, right, or whatever tool it is, right? But all it's done is cut out the people factor and I think a big thing is the, the connection there, you know, especially when... You know, because I think a big thing is um, this is nothing against Microsoft. I like a lot of the stuff Microsoft are doing. And I'm actually in talks with Microsoft in regards to some stuff at the moment. But the hardest thing with some of the Microsoft tools is where are they? Do you know what I mean? You usually yeah. got to drop down something and then go into something else and then find that or, I, I, or click I, something and then it's there and all that. I yeah. find I find Microsoft's websites to be like government websites. They're just like go to our website. We've got all these amazing resources, and, I'm, and I get there, and I'm like, where? It's the hell all is reading. It? You cannot yeah. connect with a person and have that personal like. And sometimes that's what we need. We need mm-hmm. to be able to talk to someone and go, "Hey, look, I can't find this," or and you know, little things like that. So you're dead mm-hmm. right, Shay. And I think even, and you're right, with some of the clients I've worked with, you know, we've done screenshots and saved it all and I've talked them through this is how we install it on your computer and then, you know, they might be on their home computer. So we've mapped it out so they can go and do it themselves. So you're building those skills and that capacity to be independent. But also we do need someone to talk to. Like I can't, my writing's at a certain level where I need a human being. AI can only do so much, you know, and I need someone to sit down and talk through and work through it with me. Um, So we'll never we will always need that connection um but it's i think they're the main things that are, we're finding really helpful and for some people we found that the coaching costs are too expensive so we're about to launch a group session where people can come once a month and we talk about a topic that's important mm. like mental health or workplace adjustments and people can come and uh, have that peer support and be able to listen to someone and get that help they need on a monthly can, basis can i say so 
Just on um, you were talking about AI and that before, I've tried to use some AI like you know things to help with writing a blog or whatever like that to make it faster. Not that mm. I, I don't mind writing. Do you know what I mean? Because I'm actually good at um, sharing stories in in word format. Just sometimes that word format might not be the best. But what I've found when I have used AI to try and do that, it just doesn't bring me out in that writing. It just doesn't sound right, if that Uh, makes sense. And I think that's where a lot of people don't understand AI is a long way from being useful, Um, especially if you want it to sound like yourself you know mm. um i i i don't know following the technology i believe there might come a day where that is possible and i think it might be closer than we think but i think uh, you know for a good while yet um you know i'm not i'm not being replaced in my job of search engine optimization because there's a lot of human consideration and stuff and you know content marketing is is very human so i think um yeah i think it'd be hard to do a podcast again. with an ai <laughs> Boy, yeah, you know yes, I mean? that is very true and i really need help with search optimization but mm. um <laughs> i won't derail us but yeah. you're right but you know will it can help you have a framework and so i use chat gtp it writes my blogs for me so mm. it gives me the framework and then what i do then is spend half an hour going in and personalizing it to make it mm. so it is coming from me but having that structure really helps me, one, because it, I couldn't get the blogs out like I do um, so quickly mm. with all the other things I'm trying to do. Mm. Um, and so I also get it to help me write my website copy. Um, I get it to do, help me with my Facebook ads. So I give it, it's, it's a lot of playing around with, but and it does take a bit more time, but it is a lot less time in the end because yeah, you can... Yeah. The personalization is you, and you're right. That's that will never be replaced, and so it's and, it's a good framework. And I think as well that you know you're talking about Facebook ads and uh, posting and all that. I think you know those types of things. That's perfect for all of that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But if I was going to write a letter to my wife and I got an AI bot to do it, she'd be like, <laughs> "Well, what's wrong with you?" <laughs> but anyway, yeah. But, um, but in saying that, you know, what do dyslexic leaders need to do to help this conversation along in the workplace? Because, you know, I think, especially when you and I first met Shay all of those years ago, are you sort of finding that it is starting to get spoken about a bit more? We are starting to see some people in higher places really start to say, hey, look, I'm actually dyslexic myself, things like that. I think uh, the movement's occurring overseas, particularly in the UK, and I think, you know, Made by Dyslexia has done some great awareness raising around high-profile people with dyslexia. But from my experience uh, within the Australian context, I think sometimes if people are at a higher level and uh, there's no risk factor to their their reputation anymore, Mm. then they may come out. Uh, but generally we don't we're not seeing a huge amount of leaders come out and say they're dyslexic. Mm. You know, with the charity, people say, I'll go and find a famous person to be your ambassador. And you know, if you look at the dyslexic famous people, there's there's probably 10, you know, or maybe 15 we could reel off at the top of our heads. Mm. Um and so it's it's not just famous people that we need to step out of the shadows because you know that's a that's a different subgroup. What we need is leaders like in mm. the high you know, whether you're a CEO, a board director, a manager, you know, if you're neurodivergent, regardless of dyslexia, whatever it might be, the more people that can say, this is me and these are my difficulties, but this is how I manage them and I manage them so well, I'm in these really mm. high up roles. Mm. Um, until we can start to have that culture change, it's it's really hard, I think, for, for the rest of the teams and organisations to say stuff. And you know what, right? In saying that, right, you know, I know, and I'm not going to name this company, but I know of a really big worldwide company that's based here in Australia. One of the co-founders is dyslexic, I know for a fact. And, you know, I tried to go to that person and all that. And, you know, they really, you know, what they, what their words were was like, you know, I don't want to become the dyslexia pin boy for this. You know, and it's like, yeah, but you know, you're doing so well. You would, you would be, 
you would you would be doing so much by even just saying something rather than nothing mm-hmm. or using your company as an example of you know all of this type of thing and it was almost disappointing to hear that if that makes mm-hmm. sense yeah we were on and I was working with the company the other month and one of the directors was going to be doing some work with me and in the end they stepped off and said oh no I don't I don't need to be involved I'll let the rest of the group go out publicly even though they speak publicly in their workplace they stepped back and I was I felt really disappointed that we couldn't um, have that type of high level representation because it, it is so important and you know and there's a lot of different reasons why people don't want to be that dyslexic poster person mm. uh, you know mm. because they're managing it doesn't really impact them and their life is okay and that's mm. great mm. but the research tells us that's not the case for a lot of dyslexics mm. and we do need some you know higher level managers and leaders stepping out and saying this is my challenge uh, and it's okay Mm, mm. Well, do you know what? When I was younger, I remember sitting, and I share this story quite often, right? You know, I remember sitting in, I was kept in at lunchtime because I was bad doing lines in, in the room, and I was so frustrated, pissed off with my teacher, all of that. And I remember in the back of my head thinking, you know, because I remember my parents would always point out famous like, you know, Tom Cruise or uh, Kerry Packer and stuff like that. You know, they were dyslexic and they've done really well. And I always used to think to myself, okay, well, how how are they ever to do it? And it's sort of, you know, and I think about that because it's sort of like that has given me sort of that motivation to go, okay, well, you know, if these people who are doing really well has, you know, lived with this and been able to, you know, go on and do great things, maybe I could do the same as well, you know, and that's been a real sort of thing. And I think the thing that sometimes annoys me with some of these leaders who do identify as dyslexic or neurodivergent is I see them doing things in other spaces. Do you know what I mean? And I think, man, like you're one of us. Do you know what I mean? And you're not, you're not behind us. Like in a way it's sort of like that's not leadership, my man. Yeah, Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's really hard. I think, uh, you know, we come with so much trauma from our schooling um, and I think sometimes the, the feelings of shame and embarrassment, like there's these deep-seated um, traumas that we have faced around our self-worth. Mm. And I don't uh, want to get emotional. <laughs> yeah. Um, if, uh, if I could, again, come on the audience. <laughs> perspective i feel like that conversation might be a little ahead um because i know that i had those feelings of embarrassment and and just not understanding um where i fit in society that kind of stuff and then in recent years we've seen it's become almost in a bad way glamorized but it, it, but you know every, every everyone is coming out now and talking about it famous people and it, it that really helped and i'm seeing the flow and effect of that and it's exactly what you're saying it, it's um we we needed those people to come out like that for us to feel comfortable and thrive and for society to start to have a different conversation because for better or worse they see celebrities or you know business people or whatever um saying that they have this and they they give that weight i guess Mm, yeah and i think i mean it's great that they're coming out made by dyslexia has made some huge progress around dyslexic awareness but sometimes Mm. like for me i worry that it, it marginalizes because we, um, you know, some of the labels around superpower and genius mm. and dyslexic, mm. you know, and dyslexic thinking is the thing at the moment. And, mm. you know, there's not, for me, confident evidence that we do think differently. It's very apparent, like we can mm. see that we do. But so I think that sometimes these labels and can polarise and there's a lot of people that don't resonate or feel that, you know, they'll never, they're never going to be like that and their life's just going to be crappy. And so you, it's hard because it's changing the narrative in, in good ways and then it's also, I think, sometimes it could be polarising. But yeah. so, There's no answer. <laughs> sometimes I see with some of these famous people who are behind these big charities, sometimes those charities, they're doing good awareness, but sometimes the information they're sharing, and like you said before, 
it, it, it's not evidence based, or the you know I've seen some release a dyslexia document in the workplace, and it wasn't even dyslexic friendly to read. Do you know what I mean? And it's sort of like, and it's it's sometimes frustrating because it's like that's not you know you're missing the point. But because they've got these big stars behind them, everyone mm. lords them. But this is why I I think, you know, you use those big stars or those famous business people to get the message out and and make the conversation happen. But once that's happening, this is where we need to come in and advocate for ourselves um, Mm. to to, to get the conversation happening correctly. Mm. Yeah, because I think the conversation's been had for us for so long. You know, whether it's been our parents, and that's not, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but, you know, we were too young to self-advocate and have a voice. But I feel like in, sometimes our voice has been taken away from us because there's professionals and experts and, you know, charities or multiple people speaking on our behalf and we're not actually sitting at the table a lot of the time um, as adults being able to share our lived experience, um, the positive and the negative, because there's both sides to it. Totally, totally. Out of uh, so we're getting close to the end here, and we might we might need to wrap it up in a sec. So, is there any interesting research that you'd like to speak on this topic? We probably that's probably for a whole nother episode. But <laughs> um, you know, where where could people maybe find some of this research? I should probably say, or you know, where is some good stuff being done? I know you're doing some great stuff, so you can plug yourself. Yes, yeah, so like I'll plug it. myself. Well, first they can go to Rethink Dyslexia to see our uh, published research. And my thesis has been turned into a book, so hopefully that will be launched in the next couple of months. And that's really to try and bring out the dyslexic voice um, from an adult's perspective. That's a useful practical resource. But there's some amazing work done by Stephen McDonald in the UK, Neil Alexander Passe as well, um, and there's, I can send you a list, Will, of different researchers. But what yeah. I've found is that there's not, um, there's not a lot of researchers like myself that are dyslexic that are just focusing on the, the lived experience of adults and particularly in the workplace. And that's really exciting that like, we're leading the way in that sense. It is. It is because I can tell you right now when people come to me, like, you know, because what I'm working towards is more working with, universities in the vet in the vet sector and all that type of stuff right so you know dyslexia in the workplace isn't really my my forte if that's the word i'm looking for so you know knowing people like yourself are around um that's really key because you know a lot of the other stuff is all really just people and you know i think and i think as well as sorry there i think as well is that Sometimes we've got to realize that dyslexia isn't just reading and writing. I can read and write not too bad. Do you know what I mean? Um, so there is a lot of other things as well, especially when it does come to the workplace, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, and I think um, my research demonstrates that, and I think some of the stuff we've talked about today also highlights that. But I think the biggest link is that job burnout and uh, mental fatigue that we end up facing that, really impacts on our well-being and our mental health and I think that's one of the biggest things that needs to be recognised in the workplace. Totally, totally. Photon, John, did you have anything else you wanted to say before we wrap it up? Uh, just that, well, I mean, A, I admire anyone who can, you know, come through neurodivergence and, and survive it and thrive, um, but in particular people who then feel impassioned to do something about the conversation and for our community and um, that sort of stuff. So um, big fan. Thank awesome, you. Awesome, awesome. Shay, for all of the listeners listening here today, where's the best place for them to get in contact with you, to connect with your work, all the amazing stuff you're doing? Uh, either through rethinkdyslexia.com.au and we can put that up for people that struggle to spell it, but also LinkedIn. I mean, just connect through me, through LinkedIn, through Shay Wasella, our Rethink Dyslexia page, or also Facebook um our rethink dyslexia page there you can contact us if that's easy as well cool cool well shay thank you so much you're looking well um thank you. <laughs> you're not that crooked you're not, not that, that crooked, crooked anymore <laughs> right. i tried to look, not move you're, look, you're looking <laughs> well but thank you so much for coming on today because you know this is a really big topic it's not spoken about enough um mm. you know 
we really need to hear more about this. And I think the work that you're doing is fantastic. And um, I think it's going to be cool. When, when you do get that stuff ready, let us know. And I'll try and share with as many people as possible because um, I think that could be really beneficial for a lot of people there. So, Shay, thank you so much. And for anyone, please, listening, please follow, subscribe, and like to all of our social media platforms. Photon, John, you have anything else you want to say before we leave, my man? I am good, my man. You are good. My name's Will Wheeler, and this is the Open Hearted Podcast. Till next time, everyone. Thank you.